So right away, I want to remind everybody, you know, whatever we've talked about before, what I've shown, because a lot of people seem to uh, not understand the, the word and what it really means and what people are, are, are saying when they're talking about that somebody is swarthy. All right. So I'm going to remind everybody again. This is from my video, The Black Jacobites, John McKay or McKee, description of the Jacobite complexion from an old book, 1733. All right. And in this book, you know, we read from it and they're describing all these Jacobites with uh, a complexion being black, black complexion, black or brown complexion. All right. But in this part of the video, in the beginning, just wanted to go over uh, what Benjamin Franklin again said in his time about what the Europeans really look like. Most of them. All right. And also the definition of Swarthy. We're going to get it from the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. Now, remember. You know, 1828 is after 1733 and the 1700s, all right? So, but we're going to let you know clearly so you can understand. We're going to get two different people telling you. We're going to get Webster's Dictionary, and then we're going to get somebody in the Moorish community letting you know as well what Swarty means. So let's get it again like the first time, this part of the video. I recommend you, if you haven't seen this video, to go ahead and uh, check it out fully, all right, when you have the chance. We're going to just get this part again. Here we go. All right, but uh, before we begin, I just want to go ahead and read, a, you know, something that we've I've read before in a lot of videos, and it has to do with uh, something Benjamin Franklin said. All right, so before I begin the video, I wanted to remind everybody uh, this information, well, this book that we've gone over, uh, something Benjamin Franklin said that we need to really uh, pay attention to, right? So uh, the book is called Obser Observations Concerning the Increase of Mankind, Peopling of Countries, um, by Benjamin Franklin. All right, Benjamin Franklin wrote this. All right, this is from 1755. All right, and we're on page 10 of this book, and this is what Benjamin Franklin says. Says point 24, which is making observations. Right, he's given, which leads me to add one remark. He says that the number of purely white people in the world is proportionally very small. It's very small. You're the minority. All Africa is black or tawny. Asia, chiefly tawny, all right, tawny, a darker complexion, right, not not white. America, exclusive of the newcomers, holy soul, all right, what is that saying? America is what? Black or tawny, holy soul, except the new people, the newcomers, meaning that the aboriginals that were already there is holy what? Black or tawny, all right, Benjamin Franklin, and you know, and in Europe, the Spaniards, Italians, French, Russians, Swedes are generally of what we call swarthy complexion. Swarthy. All right, just in case you don't know what swarthy is, and just a quick reminder, we're here in the American Dictionary of the English Language. All right. This is actually Webster's uh, 1828 uh, Dictionary. All right, I got the official PDF. We're going to go all the way to the word uh, swarthy. All right, and right here, it says Swart, right? Almost sounds like Stuart. Swart, Stuart, Swart, Stuart. I would they get the Stuart, did it mean black or dark? What is Swart? It says being of dark hue, moderately black, tawny, Swart. All right, down here it says Swart to make tawny or brown. Swart, an apparition. <laughs> Swartly. All right, duskly with a tawny hue. It says swartness, tawniness, a dusky or dark complexion. Dark complexion, right? Dark complexion, swarthy, being of a dark hue or dusky complexion. Tawny, in warm climates, the complexion of men is universally what? Swarthy or what? Black in warm climates. 
is there only warm climates in Africa? No, we have warm climates all over the world, right? The Moors, Spaniards, and Italians are more swarthy than the French, Germans, and English. This says their swarthy hosts would darken all our plains. Swarthy, right? Black, as the swarthy African says, right? As the swarthy African. So the African is swarthy, right? Swarthy is a tawny color. Swartish, somewhat dark or tawny. Swarthy, swarthy, tawny, all right? So you get the picture, right? Swarthy, so an African is swarthy, right? Black, right? So again, he said, Benjamin Franklin, that in Europe, the Spaniards, Italians, French, Russians, Russians, French, Italians, Spaniards, and Swedes are generally of what we call a swarthy complexion, black complexion, as are the Germans. So is the Germans. So who's the real Quakers and Puritans that were coming over here? Just, all right, so just to uh, correlate uh, with the swarthy definition and what it really means, a lot of people, again, uh, make fun of it. Like, it doesn't mean, it's supposed to mean a so-called Negro person or a black, so-called black. That don't mean me. Uh, ain't nobody swarthy in the senses. You know, they make fun and, uh, you know, people, you know, they don't study. But I'm going to let their own teacher tell them exactly what it means. And I just want to show what he has on the screen here. Again, definitions of... Uh, you know what, uh, you know, the Morris he's saying here says a Negro, a Black Amor, a Maori, the inhabitants of Mauritania. This name is derived from their black complexion, right? And this is more, a Black Amor, a Negro. And then on the bottom says Schwartz, Swarty, Schwartz, same thing, Schwartz is Swarty. A Black Amor or a Black Moor, a Negro. All right, Schwartz also means Negro. Swarty means Negro, Swarty, complexion, Negro, Schwartz, Negro. All right, a lot of people making fun of that. Asir the Duke is showing you Schwartz means Negro. Asir the Duke is telling you Schwartz, all right? And then he's breaking it down, how deep it goes, how ancient it goes, all right? All right, so we're going to read from this book now. Uh, this book is called Nature Knows No Color Line. Very good book. Had it for a while. A lot of people recommended it. This is from J.A. Rogers. And right away, just wanted to show this, uh, which he has in his book, which I've shown in my uh, previous videos, Swart to Europe and uh, other videos. And a lot of people are just showing these. Uh, again, Negroes in coat of arms this here of noble families. Rick Gorsher, right here. Down here says John Franz Ecker, Caffin Litenek, 1695-1727. So German, no, the crowns and the Archbishop Mitris. Up here. Waffenberg. All right, you see that? Strasoldo the third. Kliefstein, Central European, is this here? This is uh, another one right here. And Negroes in coat of arms of noble families. Yeah, Chris Mala, I believe it says here. Wise, Gerber, Biller, Bavis, and Citavia. All right, you see all that? This is the original people. Graf Koritowski, Taurnir, or Tonner. All right, Central European. Again, the Morils, Moor, Moren, Mina. Families with names of Negro origin, Upper Holland, Center, Middle, Portuguese, the other German. All right, all over Europe. Again, all over Europe. Why would they put their slaves all over their family crest? Because they're, these are not the slaves. These are the actual people. And we got another one right here. And this one says again, Germany. It says Johann Theodor Herzog Bayern, Cardinal Bishop. All right. And it, you know, it says coat of arms of German Cardinal. Note the crown of the Negro head. All right. And on this side, we have more uh, Sautern. Schwartz, you see that Schwartz, Swarty, Schwartz, Stuart, Swart, Stuart, Schwart, Schwartz, Schwartz, Spanny, Moore, Morin, Kopf, Moringer, Metal, Assam, Bua, Amorim. Look at that, he's pale skin, the Amorim. Amorim is pale skin, look at that crest. Germany and Portugal. We got another one right here, Negroes and Coat of Arms of European Cities. Alcarbi, St. Peter, Mitri, Neil Quastel, Wise, 
All right, the wise family. You see all these family crests. Center left, arms of Aragon, Spain. Aragon, right? Center right, arms of Kammersburg, Austria. St. Peter, foremost saint and founder of the Catholic Church, is shown as jet black Negro. All right, St. Peter, a Negro. Jet black Negro, St. Peter. Over here. Up here we have Stutewapen, Champagne. Longgen, Coburg, Avengers, Pappenheim. All right, you see that? Why does this almost look like a teepee? Huh? <laughs> and then you see the faces. All right, take a very good look. And it says here, center right, the Black Madonna. And Christ of Alt Otten, Bavaria. Lois says left, St. Maurice in the coat of arms of Coburg, Germany. All right, again, the Black Madonna and Christ over here, supposedly. Now, I wanted to come to uh, page 123, you know, but most of the book is really good. There's a lot of good information in here, breaks down, you know, who was possibly of color back in the days, you know, Roman times, whatever, the Greeks and all that, Turkish and all that. Uh, this part right here was very interesting. I wanted to read this to you because we have mentioned about, you know, the Huguenots, who they really were expelled Jews and Moors from Spain and Portugal. We know that, you know, in Spain and Portugal, these Iberians were of color, most uh, likely uh, in general. And so right here, it backs up and correlates what we were saying, what we've, you know, read before and who these Huguenots really were, what complexion they were. Uh, a lot of them were Sephardic Jews, again, and Moors. And it says here, Wade says, an interesting gradation of all shades down to the black is exhibited by the Jews, especially dark, where the Jews of Spain and Portugal, all right? Especially dark were what? The Jews of Spain and Portugal, Sephardi Moors, right? The Portuguese Jews were very dark, says Prichard. The Duchess de Abrantes, wife of Napoleon, ambassador to Portugal, said that the Jew, the Negro, and the Portuguese could be seen in a single person. Again, the Jew, the Negro, and the Portuguese could be seen in a single person person against so when they were saying a negro coming from portugal well it's the same thing as a jew it's the same thing as an as a regular portuguese it's not it means it was an african so dark were the jews especially of portugal and southern spain that many whites thought of all jews were black or dark because when they ran into these people in spain and met jews there people were like oh jews are dark jews are black there were so many there. They were so dark they, that they thought Jews were black or dark. This belief, said Barbert, shows what an error most people are in. Since he says the German Jews, as for example, those of Prague, are as white as most of their German countrymen, right? So who's these, these Ashkenazi uh, Jews? Many of the Jews who were banished from Portugal by John II, all right? Jews that were banished from Portugal, now listen to this, settled in the West Indies, all right, Portuguese Jews, all right, people of black complexion, people that are the same as a Negro, remember what they said, ended up in the West Indies. John Bigelow, who visited Jamaica in 1850, saw the descendants of these Jews and says they were Negroid, all right? All right, these Jews that ended up in Jamaica, they were what? Negroes so-called Negroes, they weren't African slaves being sent over there as prisoners of war, as indentured servants, servant time in plantations or providing their service as servants. All right, they, they weren't coming from Africa. You've been told a lie. This is just more correlation to what I've shown you before. You see how it all keeps correlating and correlating. How many sources do I have to show? All right, look at this big one. Do you understand what this means? Do you understand? You got to understand this might be in your genealogy. If you're in the West Indies and in the Americas. You can't generalize. The Eastern Jews who settled in Austria, Poland, and Russia were Negroid too. All right, they were Negroid too. Count Adam Gudowski of Poland, who visited the United States in 1857, said the Jews of his country strongly resembled American mulattoes. They resemble what? American mulattoes? Oh, numbers of Jews, he said, 
have the greatest resemblance to the American mulattoes. Sallow complexion, thick lips, crisp black hair. Of all the Jewish populations scattered over the globe, one-fourth dwells in Poland. I am therefore well acquainted with their features. On my arrival in this country, America, I took every light-colored mulatto for a Jew. He hear what he's saying? Considerable Negro strain was found too among the Polish Jews in London. For years, two New York white dailies, the news and the mirror, or dailies, have been advertising kinky hair strained permanently in one treatment. The service is for whites only. The customers are probably Jews. A Negro hairdresser in Harlem once had many of them among her, her customers. Karl Marx, who bore a strong resemblance to Frederick Douglass, undoubtedly came of this Negroid stock. All right, His nose was broad, his hair frizzy, and his color so dark he was called the Moor. Karl Marx was called what? The Moor. Karl Marx was called what? The Moor. Karl Marx was a Moor. 37. Negro strain was even more evident in Ferdinand LaSalle, aristocratic founder of socialism. Marx, his rival, called him a Jewish nigger, a greasy Jew from Breslau who was always concealing his woolly hair with all kinds of hair oil and makeup. All right, you hear this? This is quotes. All right. In a letter to Engels, March 7, 1856, he said to LaSalle, It is perfectly obvious from the shape of his head and the way his hair grows that he is descended from Negroes. So a lot of this is very, you know, racial, very racist comments. Another source of considerable Negro strain in the white stock were the black pages, who were common in the families of the nobility and the rich throughout Europe as far north as Russia. These blacks were so used for many centuries and as late as the First World War. They usually married into white families and are undoubtedly some of the Schwartz, all right, some of the what? Schwartz, Schwartz, Schwartzmann, Moors, and others in European code of arms. Oh, you really think so? These are the original. The park at St. Saucy, residence of the Prussian rulers, has bust of some of these Negro favorites, all right? So we've seen a lot, again, a lot of these crests. In fact, Negro ancestry crops up in some of the unexpected places as in the Swedish royal family, all right, in the Swedish royal family. Bernadotte, its founder, had a slight Negro strain inherited in southern France, and Gustavus IV had considerably more, as I have shown in volume one of Sex and Race, portraits of Gustavus IV, especially one of him on horseback by La France and the Junger, and now in the private collection of Baron Rammel, leave no doubt of this. All right, he's showing him be, to be a so-called Negro man. In short, Germans are not the pure white many assert they are. Several German writers agree on that, among them Frederick Hertz, Brunel Springer, and Rudolf Rocker. Beethoven, for instance, is named by all three as showing Negro blood. All right, Beethoven, Springer, names among others, Dr. Ernest Schwesch-Wieninger of Italian Negro ancestry, who was professor of dermatology at the University of Berlin and was private physician to the great German Chancellor Bismarck. Rocker includes Martin Luther and Goethe. All right, Martin Luther, all these people, what Swarthy, so-called Negro people, people of color. He says we need but think of Luther, Goethe, Beethoven, who lacked almost completely the external marks of the Nordic race and whom even the most outstanding exponents of the race theory characterized as hybrids with oriental Levantese and negro malayan strain in them all right nobody taught them as pure peoples what he's saying the first world war brought considerable mixing principally between french negro soldiers french negro soldiers and german women on the rhine and was discussed in volume one of sex and race the offspring of these are gradually disappearing into the white population disappearing really hmm. says here chapter eight uh, Negro ancestry in the French. It says the Moors, as was seen, invaded France in the 8th century and remained there until the 12th. All right, so a type of Moor, right? Because originally there was already people of color there. We've seen that they've, they've uh, we've read already that they found the bones of these little dark men all over the caves and, and from ancient times. All right, so there was already dark people in these places, but this type of Moors 
again they're telling us also invaded in the eighth century and remained there until the 12th all these centuries right when they were absorbed into the population so what does that mean absorbed into the population if the local population there already was dark as well all right five centuries later in 1609 now pay attention to this part now remember french huguenots right who were the french huguenots it says here in 1609 this stock was reinforced by the entry. What stock? A Moorish stock. What Negro stock, right? Moorish stock was reinforced by the entry of about a million, about a million more who came in on the invitation of Henry IV on their final expulsion from Spain. All right. Their final expulsion ever since the 1300s, even up to 1492 and even after that. And this is their final, like, okay, you guys got to really get out of here and leave. All these Sephardic Jews and Moors, remember, these were all people of color. These were dark-skinned people, dark-skinned people, all right, what you would call a Negro, so-called Negro. A million of them entered France, a million. These people became what the Huguenots, remember that. Let's not forget our past videos and the past teachings. This is correlation. It's telling you right here. They settled in Auvergne. Where their strain is still evident in the general population, there is a strong Negro strain. Many of says John Gunter, among those of Moorish stock were such noted figures as Bertrand du Guesclin, Charles Bernadotte, Napoleonic Marshal and King of Sweden. All right, King of Sweden, jo Joaquim Murat, Napoleon's brother-in-law, and King of Naples and Pierre Laval, twice premier of France. Laval was an Avernant and rather Negroid in appearance. You see, all these Negro, wealthy, um, royal, like noble uh, Europeans. All right, I just want to show this one here. It says, uh, a drawing from France. And as you can see here, look at all the uh, people of color. They are in every position, even noble. You see this soldier, he looked like, he dressed like Napoleon and all that, like one of his chief and commanders, right? Like even the, the poor people, all right, but everybody here. And it says that left types of Negro soldiers of Napoleon, right? A black pioneer, let me see. And a pioneer, <laughs> a French pioneer. You see this French pioneer in America? You see who the French look like? You see this French pioneer? They're letting you know here. Look at that drop. They're letting you know right here. A French pioneer or a black pioneer who's from France. Look at that. Continuing the book, Nature Knows No Color Line, where in chapter 10, says here, Negro ancestry in white America. Says here, as regards the whites of the New World, it is evident that some were already of Negro European. All right, the whites. Remember what we read earlier, color white, complexion dark. All right, so this white is a status. So what do you mean they're Negro European and why are you calling them whites? All right, so the whites, so-called whites, were already Negro European strain, especially the Spaniards and the Portuguese. Again, the Spaniards, who's the conquistadors? De Soto, Columbus, Hernan Cortez, Pizarro. Who are these Spaniards and Portuguese coming over here? These are Moors, Negro European. All right, in volume two of Sex and Race, considerable evidence was also given of the Negro strain in the American whites as the result of slavery. Evidence given here in addition. All right, so they're trying to add their little thing. It says, contact of whites and Negroes in the United States began with the coming of the Spaniards to Florida. All right, listen to this part, because we've already broken this down in my past videos, who these people really were. I'm going to break it down again after I read what he's going to say. Now, he's going to give you a little bit of a drop, but we're going to get deeper. It says, contact of whites and Negroes in the United States began with the coming of the Spaniards to Florida in 15. 12. Again, remember who the Spaniards are. They were Negro Europeans. All right. In 1512, Negro European Spaniards or Moors or Sephardic Jews, since these first comers were only men, the first mixed bloods were of the offspring of white and Negro men with Indian women. All right. So, because they were mostly men, these Negro Spaniards, right, mix in with what? They amalgamated, they assimilated with what? The Indian women, local, all right, the Aborigine, people of color too. 43 years after the first landing, listen to this, the city of St. Augustine was founded. The Negroes, the Negroes, who's these Negroes who helped build it, lived among 
the Indians. They lived among the Indians. Who's these Negroes that helped build it? Who were the Spaniards? Who were they bringing over as servants? Black Latinos, so-called Latinos. We got that before. Or other Carib Indians coming in from Hispaniola or Jamaica, all these islands in Cuba. They were bringing up. We read this already. All right. Even those Negroes were helping build and they were mixing in with other Indians. There is no record of a Negro nurse in the hospital there in 1597. So the Spaniards and Negroes continued their exploration going as far west as Lower California and as far northwest as Kansas. They reached Virginia in 1526 Negroes, right? Now, what does that debunk right away? Didn't they tell us that the first so-called Negroes came in in 1619? Right? So this right here, which is a fact, because they're talking about the expedition of the Alion, which we have already read before in numerous uh, scholarly books you know from those times and anthropological books historic books of the Spaniards and its expeditions and D alone in 1526 he did bring up Negroes and we know that the Spaniards are Negroes themselves so they didn't just so they brought up themselves as Negroes right one and the Negroes they brought up or the slaves or servants were Carib Indians this was documented we've read this before in scholarly sources all right, these weren't Africans, these weren't uh, just European blacks, which is themselves, but they also had black Caribs bringing up in 1526 under D alone. But the colony of 500 broke up when the Indians and Negroes revolted, forcing the Spaniards to return to the south. So these Negroes they brought up again, they were what? Caribs. The Caribs, the Caribs got together with the local Indians and they revolted against the Swarthy or Moorish Spaniards, other people of color, to return to the south. Now we've read this before. Remember, they had that they, they had to leave like 150 behind or 150 behind state. They never tried to go back. They just stayed there. Now let's see what he says. It says the Negroes undoubtedly made their homes with the Indians, all right? The ones who left behind, a lot of some of these Sephardic and Moorish people and these Caribs and other Negroes, what happened? They stayed behind and made their homes with the local Indians. Thus, it seems safe to say that there was some Negro strain in Virginia before the coming of the English in 1607, all right? And before 1619. The whole history you've learned is a lie. It's all a lie. It says the next to arrive were the French and the English. Again, who were the French? Huguenots and the English. A lot of these people were swarthy too. So let's not forget that, all right? Just because they're European. The latter, mostly men, made it with Indian and Negro women, all right? They made it with what? Indian and Negro women. Who's the Negro women again? If there were only men coming. All right, who's these Negro women? Again, same, right? Indians, probably, most likely. All right, so these French... More Swarti Europeans made it with other Swarti Indians. Remember, the French Huguenots especially amalgamated, assimilated everywhere they went, especially South Carolina and everywhere they went. All right, and this is from my, uh, just to remind everybody, we've gone over the information where we're showing, you know, that Europe originally was also, you know, what we call Swarti or people, uh, you know, who was up dark skin in general. All right, and this is just some examples of what we talked about in this video. I'm showing some Etruscan uh, art here. Uh, we got this guy, you see his uh, beard, and you see the type of hair he has. All right, so there's all kinds of uh, pottery there. Uh, this is uh, from Kardash, as you can see. And even in the Greek vases, you'll see like a light-skinned person and a dark-skinned person. They depicted different people, different complexions. You find that all over the Greek vase interpreting their gods Greeks Hercules all you know all of them and, and shows their complexion in these Greek bases um, and this book right here it's a great uh, book of family crest from Great Britain and Ireland and this was a very good find I got in archive.org and I'm showing here some of the families here the and their uh, family crest who they depict in these are not slaves these are act their actual family crest yeah, they have the numbers uh, mean uh, somewhere when you go look for the numbers like number eight right here you'll go see what family that is and what it's related to it's all listed there I got all the sources and everything so I just want to show 
uh, the different examples of what they have there so you can see they don't just have like you know swarthy or, or, or what you call so-called negro people um, but yeah they're all over the book uh, I just want to zoom in onto some of them like this one you see all right so who does that remind you of so Europe you know was swarthy and that's what I'm showing in this video uh, again swarthy Europe and its aboriginal inhabitants this was from July of this year this is a uh, part one uh, show many uh, crests, a lot of coins showing, depicting the people, uh, some more information. All right, so it's a very good book. All right, we talk about who, you know, Charles V possibly could, can be, and most likely is. We show, for example, a picture of him right here. Uh, this is Charles V all the way at the end down here, and this is the Incas. You see the same complexion, dark people, melanated people. All right. This is from the Larco Museum in Lima, Peru. It's hanging there. And that's uh, from those times, contemporary. All right, so Charles V, yes, he was a so-called black man, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. Yeah, so you gotta always understand, you know, it's not just pale-skinned white people coming over here as colonists or conquistadors, all right? This is the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V right here. All right, that's what I'm showing in this video. All right, very good information. Again, let's just uh, go a little bit more ahead so you can see we're just all over the place showing so many different things. These are Etruscans. All right, and it says on the right and Hercules on the left, you see that? And it's just all over the place. You see this, this is Minoans. West are the Asians, right? Asians, black Asiatics, remember? What I drew Aaliyah said about the black Asiatics. Who are they, you know? can't always just be like oh yeah well ancient china or ancient asia was all black people okay then so why are you saying mongols are light-skinned <laughs> so one of the mongols original mongols be uh, also melanated black people asiatic blacks all right again this is minoans right here and this is a good one right here these three sisters right here look at that look at their hair playing music it says minoan so a lot of uh, information on this video. All right, again, just wanted to show some examples. All right, so we got this book, a description of the Western Islands of Scotland. All right, and this is an old, pretty old book, primary source. It says here, the inhabitants of this island are well proportioned, generally brown. They're generally brown and some of a black complexion. All right, brown and black complexion the inhabitants of this isle what isle Iran the isle of Iran Iran or Aaron Iran all right look at this the isle of Gige the inhabitants of all Protestants and speak the Irish tongue generally look at this Protestants who's the Protestants Huguenots right the inhabitants are all Protestants and they speak Irish tongue generally there being but few that speak English all right, what does it say about them? They're all fair or brown in complexion. Brown, they're brown in complexion. Brown, all right? So just again, a lot of examples. We go through a lot of source. That's part one. And this would be part two, all right? Just in case you guys haven't seen that. And then I did my Huguenots video and Alexander Hamilton, the Swarthy West Indian, Jewish. All right, he's a Huguenot. His mom was a Huguenot. Is that a Scottish man, they say? I, we just saw a Scott man, you know, be enlisted as dark complexion. All right, so don't sleep on that. And so make sure to catch all these videos, the Huguenots. Who's the real Huguenots? In this video, we go over this uh, great book, Ancient and Modern Britons, a retrospect. Um, very good book. A lot of good sources um, that he has. Very scholarly. A lot of good research of the uh, people of Britain and uh, Europe. Recognizing the racial characteristics in the small swarthy Welshman and the small dark Highlander and the black cells to the west of Shannon. All right. This is all the authors he quoted that have said this and found all these different skulls and accustomed to bury them tombs. Their remains have been found in Belgium and France and Britain and Germany and Denmark as well as in Spain. All right. These people. A little further down on the same book, it says here. Seuss ingeniously conjectures that the first syllables are equivalent to the German Schwartz. Schwartz is black 
and that the whole word is a translation of the Slavic Shorshny Ugri, Black Ugri, by which the Hungarians are known in later Russian writers. The Hungarians were Black Ugri, all right, Hungarians. White and black as is well known means with Eastern writers, little more than dominant and dependent. Thus the Black Khazars, the Black Khazars or Hungarians were the subjects of the white Khazars. You see, there was a black Khazar, original people, these original Russian Hungarians, these original Rus. Look, black, Kara. Kara means black. All right. Kara means black. It says this word is an example of the Ugrian element in Celtic speech. In Gaelic, it is Kiar or Thiar, which is spelled Kar, Kar or Ker, Kar, Ker. In modern Scottish surnames, all which are simply Kiar. The final A of the slower speaking Mongoloids have dropped off. But the word is the same. It now means swarthy or dark brown. Swarthy or dark brown. Again, swarthy means dark brown rather than black. Rather than black. There ain't nobody black. It means dark brown. Dark brown ain't no black. First, has a crayon color. It means dark brown, which signification attaches more distinctly to the word dub. Dublin. All right. Dublin. Dub. All right. Means what? Dark brown. Dub. All right. Dub. Dub, dub, dark brown, dub, dub is dark brown, dub, see, D and B, dub is dark brown, that's what it means. This part of the video I'm showing the German tapestry from 1400 AD supposedly, and it's funny because it's showing a castle here and some people in it protecting it from an invasion of some other people, and when we get close up, as I'm going to show you right now, in this video I start showing, right, you see, so these are pale skinned wild looking people you see them they're wild almost <laughs> right and you see who's defending the, the castle right these are swarthy people or what dark brown people swarthy so called black people in the castle defending shooting them the wild people you see this is historic you can google this right now again the German tapestry 1400 AD look it up alright so you see these wild pale skinned men and you see they all got beards the white, the pale skin people and the Swarthy people got beards too. Uh, you see with their crowns, the king and queen, they're over there like, yeah, give him the thumbs up. He's like, yo, watch out. All right, the princess. And he's like making sure they ain't going in. They're all watching, right? He's all Swarthy people in the castle, right? So that was one thing I'm showing in this video uh, too. So I wanted to show you this uh, video I found on YouTube. Very interesting to correlate with what we're learning today about, you know, the black nobility, I guess, is, is what they say, or Moors or black Europeans, uh, dark skin, complexion. This is from the YouTube channel CBC Arts. Thank you for bringing this uh, educational uh, video to us. Uh, this is for fair use. This is not my video. This is from this channel. We're just using this for education and commentary. All right, so before we start, I actually wanted to show you what they're going to be talking about in this video, which is this painting of um, 1570, around 1570 to 1580 in Portugal, Lisbon, Portugal. And I'm going to zoom in. First, I'm going to read, it says, Dutch painting of the Chafaris del Rey, a square with the king's fountain. Lisbon, Portugal. The man who is believed to be the king is wearing the cross of the Order of Santiago, St. James which was founded in the 12th century to drive back the Moors from the Iberian Peninsula, all right? So you see that a Moor versus Moor war, that uh, symbol he got on, he's a saint. Uh, he's from the Order of Santiago of St. James. These people were basically driving back the Moors. So this colored person was helping drive back the Moors, all right? A Moor versus Moor war, he's probably a Catholic, all right? Or represented the uh, Catholic monarchy. So I'm going to zoom in real quick. All right, just so you can see. You see that? See him wearing? All right, I've shown this before in other videos. Just wanted to show it again real quick because that video is talking about it. So you can see there's people of color all over the place. This picture is a lot uh, bigger, this painting, I mean. It goes all the way over here and more on this side as well. This is just a little piece of it. Uh, but the person is in the video is actually going to go to the original painting right now. They're going to be talking about it. All right. So I wanted to show that to you guys. Let's go back to the video. All right. So again, fair use. All right. So we're here at a palace just outside of Lisbon to see the painting Seferish del Rey. 
includes a figure of a black knight that caught Curtis's eye two years ago online and has inspired the whole body of work he's been making here in Portugal. I just kept trying to zoom in on this pixelated image to see this knight to be like, is he really a black knight? And then finding out that he is wearing the Santiago of the Red Cross and my last name being Santiago. And there was something so romantic about this painting. Whoa. Yeah. This is wild. So this is someone's house. Yes. It's real. <laughs> Hello, little one. A guard dog. I'm Curtis. Oh, you're sweet. You're the, you're the sweetest attack dog I've ever seen. This 15th century former royal palace is now one of the many homes of the Berardos, oh. one of Portugal's wealthiest families. Oh, I think I found it. Oh my god. Wow. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Wow. Much of what we know about the reign of the Moors was discovered in works of art. And although the artist of this painting is unknown, it tells us a lot about the Lisbon of its time. When you look at a painting online, you can only see so much. Oh, but the way that knight is painted is so beautiful. He's so noble. Yeah. And his eye is on a completely different horizon. My understanding of the painting becomes dramatically different when I can actually see the interactions going on. When I look at like the people who are lower caste dressed, you see a mix of different nationalities. When you say or it's nation, I wouldn't even say nationalities, but like cultures, cultures, yeah, yeah. When you say it's different from what you imagined, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Okay, well, there's more black people. <laughs> First of all, because the image becomes some images, you can't tell if it's shadow. Sure. Look at this, this character, and it's my sensitivity because I'm of African descent. You see this character being carried away by, what is it, security, which... Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? It's mm -hmm. not too different. I love how naive this painting is. It, 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 it's closer to the images I'm making than I thought hmm. of these two men here they're like in conversation and again I'm drawn to these moments of like mixed race interaction where mm -hmm. there isn't a higher system appear to be like a higher or higher hierarchy mm -hmm. Hmm. and see these are things I you can't tell until you see it now I can incorporate how the lace is made there the hint of that oh that face is gorgeous they have weaponry so they're of the order, possibly younger, but they're both men of color. Hmm. I can stare at him forever. Huh. All right, so that was, you know, real quick. Just wanted you to see that, you know, so you can acknowledge that these things are real. These paintings do exist. These are not Photoshop. I'm not making this up. These are not memes on the internet. This is actually in somebody's house. This is from a royal, uh, you know, this used to be a royal you know, part of the royal palace, I guess, or somebody that lived in there that was royalty. Now this rich person lives in there. He owns this painting. You see, that's a black knight of the Order of Santiago. All right? All right, this is the book, The Scottish Nation, or the Surnames, Families, Literature, Honors, and Biographical History of the People of Scotland by William Anderson. This is volume two, 1863. I'm on page 71 of this book, and it says here, Duff, a surname adopted from the Celtic, in which language the word means black. All right, Duff means black. Sibald, in his history of Fife, says that as Niger and Rufus were names of families amongst the Romans from the color and complexion of men, so it seems Duff was from the swarthy and black color of those of the tribe or clan of Macduff, all right? Swarthy, black, tribes, Macduff, Duff. All right, now I'm reading from this book. It's called The Proceedings of the Royal Irish Academy, second series, volume two, Polite Literature and Antiques, Dublin. This is published from the uh, years 1879, 1888. It says here, I'm on page 47 of this book. I'll bring you right here, it says now at two primitive Irish races, which he designates as Firbolg and Celt, 
he has given typical figures. One of these, the fair bowl cranium, will in all probability correspond with the remarkable dolicocephalic skull that I have described. These long-headed, black visage, dark-haired, swarthy aboriginals, swarthy, black-haired, black visage, swarthy, swarthy aboriginals possess skulls that are principally characterized by their extreme length from before backwards or what is technically termed the antero posterior diameter and the flatness of their sides all right all right again swarthy aboriginals he says in addition now we find similar conditions of head still existing among the modern inhabitants of this country particularly beyond the shannon where the darker fur bulk race a darker even a darker race in these swarthy aboriginals may still be traced as distinct from the more globular headed light-eyed fair-haired celtic people who live to the northeast of that river i'm on page 53 of this book now and i go down here to this paragraph and it says the most probable explanation appears to be that it was the result of one of those piratical descents or invasions of the irish coast made by robber vikings danars or black danes black danes again black Dane, Danish, Black Norsemen, Black Vikings, Black Danes, Black Vikings, the Six Kings, Vikings, B.I., Six Kings, the Six Danish Kings, Danites, and their ferocious allies from the islands of Scotland, which were so common in the 9th and 10th centuries. These invasions took place subsequent to and were altogether different from the Scandinavian settlements in Ireland of Loglands or Azure Gentiles, who are described in the chronicles of the time by their distinctive feature of being a white or fair-haired uh, race. All right, so different from the Black Danes. I found this video, this channel had some great references to correlate what I'm showing in my videos. Uh, if you like his videos, I'm gonna hit like right here, subscribe and like. Again, it's called Black European History Revealed. This is from the channel Straight Up. All right, like and subscribe. And he got some great um, references here. Again, this is from what we're seeing in the screen, Faces of Irish History, Professor of Ancient Irish History in the National University of Ireland, M.H. Gill and Son, LTD. All right, it says, many past and present archaeologists, ethnologists, and scientists agree that early inhabitants in Europe were of swarthy complexion. I will be sharing several of their quotes with you in this video. So in this book, on page 62, it says, it appears to rest on single passage of Tacitus. He is describing the Ciliars. Remember, the Ciliars are a, complex, a dark complexion people with wavy hair. A British people whose territory was in the south of Wales and who offered a very fierce resistance to the Romans. The swarthy complexion of the Ciliars, he says, the prevalence of curly hair, again, curly hair among them, and their position over against Spain argued that the ancient Iberians must have crossed over from Spain and occupied their territory. All right. So there was already swarthy people there and says here in page 63 we have often heard the occurrence of similar physical traits in the west of ireland ascribed to more recent spanish mixture it all amounts to this which irish tradition bears out and which nobody questions that these western isles contain descendants of an ancient dark complexion population probably already of mixed race which existed in western europe before the arrival of the fair complexion people whose distinctive features appear by all indications to have originated in the lands forming the basin of the baltic sea all right there you go in the same video again in the channel straight up the video black european history revealed thanks for uh, sharing this information with us uh it says here in 851 a new variety of Norsemen arrives on the Irish coast. Again, this is from the book, The Faces of Irish History by Aon McNeil. All right. And he's saying that in 851, there is written accounts of a Norseman, Norseman invasion in the Irish coast. And they are called the Black Heathens, the Black Foreigners, the Black Loch Lanarks. Remember, we got this in my Swarthy Europe video. We got this quoted in another scholarly book. We're getting it again here in contradiction to the fair heathens, fair foreigners, or fair luck luckness. All right, so these uh, dark complexion Norsemen. The Welsh Chronicle, the Annals Cambry, make it fairly clear that these black heathens were the Danes. They came in hostility to the Norwegians with whom they fought fierce battles, and we have already seen 
that for a number of years the Danes held the chief power in the Hebrides. All right, who were these uh, black Norsemen? These were Danes. The Danish people were of swarthy complexion as well. Danes, Danites, Danites, Danish. All right, on this part of the video, uh, he's showing this book, uh, Dictionary of National Biographies. There's a lot of volumes of this book. Some pretty, uh, some good jewels he has in here. Uh, this is Annie of Bohemia, Annie of Bohemia, and it says here that she is of middle in stature, swarthy complexion, long neck, wide mouth, bosom, not much race, in fact, has none but the king's great appetite. And you can actually Google her name, and if you go to Wikipedia, it'll say the same thing that she is swarthy of complexion. Over here, we got Thomas Butler, Earl of Ormondi, around the 1500s, right? It says that Thomas, who was called from his dark complexion the Black Earl, succeeded his father in the earldom and estates at the age of 14. This is from volume 8, Dictionary of National Biography, page 79. This is Lord Thomas Fairfax, 3rd Lord of Fairfax, 1612 1671. It says both of these images are from Google. All right, so he's saying how you describe how he got, uh, he found these two images. But look at the description over here. It says, in complexion, he was so dark that like Strafford, he was nicknamed Black Tom because he was so dark. He was Black Tom. Sprig, who devotes several pages to an account of his character and person, terms him tall, yet not above the first proportion, but taller, as some say, when he is in the field than at home. All right, he was so dark in complexion, this Lord Thomas Fairfax. All right, see how they whitewashed him, body snatchers. Here we got Agnes Dunbar. Dunbar, remember Dun, Dunbar? Dunbar, that's also meant brown or black. All right, Countess of Dunbar in March 1312 to 1369. 1300s, all right. Countess of Dunbar in March, known from her swarthy complexion as Black Agnes. All right. Again, this is from the Dictionary of National Biographies, volume 16, page 150. This is primary sources. This is scholarly work from her swarthy complexion. We know what swarthy means. All right. Black Agnes. All right. This is a whitewashed image of her. And this right here is Lord John Methuen, Lord Chancellor of Ireland, was the eldest son of Paul Methuen of Bradford, Wiltshire, clothed here by his wife, Grace. All right. It says here, a man of intrigue, but very muddy in his conceptions and not quickly understood in anything. In his complexion and manners, much of a Spaniard, just like a Spaniard, what? A tall black man, because what? He looked like a Spaniard because the Spaniards were so-called black. All right members of the secret service of john mckee all right but this is a national biographies again and we already got that primary source from 1733 to verify this is another source verifying it and we got another one right here this is bishop samuel horsley all right this is from dictionary of national biography volume 8 all right you can look it up he's from the 1700s to 1806 and it says here, Bishop Samuel Horsley, son of a John Horsley, principal of Edinburgh University. Description of him at age 17, his eyes and complexion, dark as a raven. You can't say, oh, they're saying dark because he got a tan. No, a raven. We all know what a raven looks like. All right. Dark as a raven. Dark as a raven. Again, let's go back. He is dark as a raven. Down here, you can see where the excerpt is from the dictionary. The National Biography, again down here, says his eyes and his complexion dark as a raven. Dark as a raven. Black, so-called black. Dark skin. Black as a raven. All right, you see the body snatches, right? Is this guy's complexion right here that you see here dark as a raven? No, right? This is a whitewashed picture. Wake up. This is another one right here, Baron Turlow. This is from Dictionary of National Biography, volume 56, page 348. Thurlow Edward, first Baron Thurlow, Lord Chancellor, eldest son of the Reverend Thomas Thurlow, 1776, to incumbent successively of Little Ashfield, Suffolk, and of Thurston, Longstrand, and Napton, Norfolk, by Elizabeth, daughter of Robert Smith, a descendant of Sir Richard Havel, Esquire of the Body, 205. Thurlow was tall, well built, and singularly majestic in appearance. His features, though stern, were regular and a swarthy complexion. Swarthy matched well with his keen black, sparkling eyes and bushy eyebrows. His bushy eyebrows. All right, down here, the excerpt, and this is the dictionary again. 
volume 56 all right swarthy complexion this is a whitewash image all right this is the book of iran volume second by wm mckenzie history and folklore the iran society of glasgow hugh hopkins now iran i believe is one of the isles in the scotland and it says here the inhabitants of this isle iran are well proportioned generally brown generally brown and some of a black complexion by that time of course other streams had passed into the current but isolated and sharply defined centers are conservative of the stock the very conditions operated towards uniformity all right what brown generally brown and some of what black complexion in the same book down here is talking about the danes again it says later a distinction appears between fingal white strangers or norse norsemen and duck gull or black strangers the danes black strangers the danes so we're all the way in a page 58 of this book and it says here we now turn to consider the planting of some left-hand stewards in iran they're going to talk one about one of these stewards all right down here in the next page it says which was in existence at least by 1385 and among the per perquisites of the office this john stewart all right this john stewart i remember the stewards who the stewards are dark-skinned people the dark complexioned or black had corrigils in iran john the steward the black or black dark complexion or black dark complexion or black all right who john steward this is in scotland in the isle of iran all right and this is another version of the book of iran edited by j a falfour all right it says archaeology is a little different than the other one I'm on page 96 of this book and it says down here from those characters of the skeletons we may thus gather that our chamber builders were a short people with relatively large long heads high narrow faces and well arched foreheads in complexion they were probably brunette all right brunette they're not talking about here they're talking about complexion as you can see they're distinguishing dark hair and when they're talking about complexion brunette so brunette dark brown 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 complexion they were certainly the same people or a branch of the same people who built the so-called long barrels i'm on page 131 and they're talking about bronze age people down here and it says in stature these new people do not appear to have greatly exceeded the earlier iberian settlers and in complexion they were probably dark like them dark just like the iberians dark more and mores right dark complexion all right so i'm gonna read from this book now it's called early man in britain and his place in the tertiary period by w boyd dawkins and these are his titles it says curator of the manchester museum and professor of geology and paleontology in owens college manchester all right this is from 18 80. page 315 of this book it says here the basque of the present day are might be expected from the many invasions they have undergone by no means uniform but the researches of dr broca prove that the real basque stock was small in stature dark in complexion with black hair and eyes and with a long head on page 316 it says here regarding some skulls they're finding there in the caves, I believe in France and Spain, uh, their foreheads are high, broad and expanded and even flattened, often flattened they say. It says human remains of this kind are met with in caves and tombs in Belgium, France and Spain. Under conditions which show that the tall race occupied those regions in the Neolithic age and the occurrence of the two forms of skull with all the intermediate varieties in chambered tombs and sepulchral caves reveals the fact that the tall invader and the small dark inhabitant the small dark inhabitant of france dwelt side by side in the same area on page 323 the author says in my belief the iberians of france and spain the sealers of wales are we gonna know who they are and what they look like later on the Ligures of southern Gaul and northern Italy and the small dark Etruscans, all right, all these people are to be looked upon as ethnological islands isolated by successive invasions, pointing out that if we could go deep enough in past time, we should find that the whole of Europe was inhabited solely by a swarthy 
non-Aryan population, Swarti. Swarti, non-Aryan population. All right, what? The whole of Europe in the past time. If we go deep enough in the past time, all right, this professor's letting you know, we would see that the whole of Europe was inhabited solely by Swarti. Swarti, meaning dark-skinned, so-called black, non-Aryan population. So are you saying all these Swarti population just disappeared, went extinct, or ended up in Africa by the colonial times? No, they came to as indentured servants and colonists and conquistadors. They were still in Europe. On page 330, it says, the strong resemblance borne by the small, dark ciliars to the Iberians was remarked, as we have already noticed, by Tacitus. At the present day, his observation applies equally to the small, swarthy Welshman. With long head and Iberian physique, the broad-headed dark Welshman is identical with the broad-headed dark Frenchman and the Welsh people may be defined ethnologically as principally Celtic and Iberian. Every intermediate variety between the two extremes being represented, the Celiars no longer form a compact ethnological island, but are scattered and dispersed and mingled with other races. A little further down, it says in Scotland, the small dark Highlander. All right, Scotland, the dark Highlanders. We're going to talk about who these people turned out to be later on in history. The Scottish Highlanders. All right, we're going to see that the Stuart line were basically Scottish Highlanders. And they were also what? Dark. As it says here in Scotland, the small dark Highlander. And in Ireland, the black Celts, the black Celts to the west of the Shannon still preserve the Iberian characteristics in more or less purity crossed with Celtic, Danish, Norse, and English blood. All right, so. In my videos, Nations of the World, where I did some uh, info on the Sumerians and the Sephardis, the Danish, Don, Don, Danish, 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 Sumerians, uh, Gimeri are mixed into this with Danites and other Hebrew people. All right. In the north, all these people were melanated people before. All right, so we we're talking about the Dark Highlanders, right? So let's just, just keep this uh, in mind while we read this next book real quick. And this one's called The Negro Question, Part 6. We've already read a couple of parts. I know a lot of you know these, these, these books, this series. Very good info. Um, you know, I, li I like it because it, it tells you things that you can research. It doesn't give you a lot of sources all the time, even though he does. Really good sources. I found a really good one. I mean, the last book we just read. I found it from this book. He sourced it. So I went to go look for the actual source and it was there. But it also tells, uh, correlates some other things in this book that I wanted you to basically see. And again, this is the dude that we just read from, Professor Boyd Dawkins, British geologist and archaeologist. He continues saying, this comment from Professor Boyd Dawkins is a verbal map concerning the location of two different races of people, black and white, living side by side in ancient Britain. This information was withheld from the world. This verbal map will lead us into one of the greatest secrets of ancient Britain and will be rehe rehearsed by the likes of Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Dr. Albert Churchward, Professor Winchell, and much more. The location of the black population of Britain, Scotland, Wales, Cornwall, Cumberland, Westmoreland, and Devon is critical to understanding who actually founded the 13 colonies. All right, who actually founded the 13 colonies? Are you paying attention? Or you want to just talk about white people being invaders or mongols being invaders asians oh let's not talk about the black so-called black invaders or colonists right it's not about color it's the point all right so if you understand who these people were that were that were living in these locations he's saying it would be critical to understand who actually founded the 13 colonies the secret of the 13 colonies cannot be found in the government-sponsored history books or social studies classes. This great secret involves time, walking. We have to mentally go backwards in time. Before the 13 colonies was ever founded, we have to examine the European landscape before the arrival of the whites. This is the secret of the black 13 colonies. 
Let's begin this research by examining a map of the ancient highlands of Scotland. All right, so he's showing this ancient map of Scotland, 18th century. And this is a zoomed in version. And it's, as you can see here, it says Stuart, 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 right? Stuart, Stuart, Swart, 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 Stuart. We got that in my Swart to Europe videos, what Stuart really meant. All right, Swart. According to the verbal map of Professor Boyd Dawkins, the blacks were pushed into the highlands of Scotland. So he's calling them the blacks crayon colors. All right. That's why I said these are good books, but he's also coming at it with hijacked terms and all that. All right. Making it a black and white world. And I believe a lot of those Europeans, even the ones that invaded, were also melanated. If you look at the map, you can clearly see that Stuart clan is named in the highlands and lowlands of Scotland. This is the location of the Black Britons that the white English pushed westward, according to Professor Boyd Dawkins. Our fathers pushed the dark Welsh west into Scotland, Wales, Highlands of Scotland, Cornwall, and Devon. King James VI of Scotland was a steward Highlander. What? King James was what? Yeah, King James was a steward. All right, so now we're getting somewhere, right? King James was a steward, so he was of these dark Welsh. All right, he was a steward. The writings of Professor Dawkins, the Ship's Manifest, and the memoirs of John McKee will validate that their 13 British colonies were founded by black, by black, the Scots, come and see, all right? So John McKay, who's the members of John McKay? He's saying that proves it. All right, so we go to my channel real quick, just a reminder, all right, because we've covered this again before. And we go to one of my videos right here, which was four months ago. It's the black Jacobite, two the Jacobites, the supporters of King James, right? Black Jacobites, John McKee. Oh, John McKee, the same guy that the author was just talking about. Description of the Jacobites' complexion from an old book. All right, and this is just one example in the video. We're 20 minutes in, about 21 minutes. Says he is a gentleman, good-natured to a fault, very well uh, bred, and have many valuable things in him. All right, black complexion, black complexion. Does this look like black complexion to you? They're lying to us. All right, liars. They took the throne. Next person we're going to look at is Charles, Duke of St. Albans. All right, who is also the son of King Charles II by, by Miss Gwynne. So we're going to take a look at him. You know, here's against Wikipedia. You know, they're just putting what is actually mainstream. This is actually what they teach, put in textbooks, college textbooks, school textbooks. This is Charles Beauclerc, first Duke of St. Albans, was an illegitimate son of King Charles II of England. We're talking about the same person here. This is the picture they got for him in Wikipedia. Do you see this? Now remember, his brother was black complexion and his dad is black complexion. Why is he so white? Oh, was Miss Gwynne a white lady? No, let's see what he really looked like. Is this his picture right here? Now it says Charles Duke of St. Albans. He is a gentleman very way de bon naturel, well bred, does not love business. He is well affected to the constitution of his country. He is a black complexion, not so tall as the Duke of Northumberland, yet very like King Charles. Turned 30 years old, all right? Black complexion black complexion is this black complexion this is pink what is this white this is pale look like he's dying he needs some sun what do you mean black complexion so now black complexion yeah so that's just a little bit of uh, that video i made all right the black jacobites uh, from the john mckee uh, memoirs uh this is a book from 1733 describing the jacobites all right so that's what the brother was just saying the author right here uh, you can read in Ship Manifest, which we've gone over. I'm going to go over again with you. Ship Manifest, describing them as Swarty, Darskin, these Jacobites prisoners, and the memoirs of John McKay. He's saying that we just saw. I did a video on already. If you haven't seen it, go check out the full video. So we're in this uh, other book. It's called The Place of the Welsh in the History of Britain by then Professor Boyd Dawkins. Honor Fellow of the Jesus College Oxford, reprinted by the Manchester Examiner. This is from 1889. It says here, The Place of the Welsh in the History of Britain. Again, ancestry of the small dark Welsh. The small dark Welsh. 
So it says here, part two, the small dark Welsh. The Welsh, as their name implies, are simply the inhabitants of Britain, strangers to the English invaders. It would be absurd to expect that the rude warriors who pushed the inhabitants of Roman Britain before them to the west, into Wales, Cumbria, and the West Wales, Devon, and Cornwall, would have drawn any subtle ethnological distinctions to the destroyers of the Roman Empire. Their foes in Britain were Brit, Brit Welsh, Brit Welsh, and in Gaul, Gaul Welsh, under which heads were included without any distinction the races which they conquered. It is clear, however, from the pages of Caesar and Tacitus that at the time of the Roman conquest, there were at least two distinct peoples in Britain, the tall, fair-haired, blue-eyed Celt, identical with the Gaelic tribes and the dark, complexioned, wavy-haired South Welshman Silures, all right? Again, two types of people, all right? Two types of Welsh people. He named fair-haired, blue-eyed. That doesn't mean pale. Fair-haired, light hair, blue-eyed Celt. That doesn't mean they were white pale-skinned white people, identical with the Gallic tribes, and the dark-complexioned, wavy-haired, wavy-haired South Welshmen. So dark complexion, they actually talk about skin here. They didn't say skin anything here. Pay attention to that. I know you're trying to say, well, that they mean they mean a white cream male. They pushed the black people over. Well, the Celts were also dark. We already know that if you watch my Swarty video, Swarty Euro video on the Celts, who they really were, what they coming out of. All right, so they, they might have blue eyes and colored eyes, though. They might have fair hair, because fair-haired, where's the complexion with them? See how it talks about dark complexion with the wavy-haired, wavy-haired, fair-haired, wavy-haired. They're talking about hair, not complexion here, right? They only mention the complexion of the salures, which is dark complexion, wavy hair. So wavy hair, right? And you're like, Kurimeo, those people don't have... Um, uh, the hair like us, wavy hair or curly hair or nappy hair or like what uh, Africans, you know, hair look like. Well, there was Welshmen with wavy hair. So now let's imagine that these some of these dark complexion Welshmen with wavy hair came to America and had descendants over here, which are called Negro today. Also, you want to think that everything that has wavy hair originated from just one place, one location or one people. This is what I'm trying to show you guys, all right? So wavy haired South Welshmen, the Siliers as they were called, who are compared by Tacitus to the Iberi of Spain. This comparison is now amply justified by a visit to most Welsh towns on a market day, say Denby or St. Asaph, where the small dark Welshman is to be seen identical in everything but dress and speech with the small dark Basque of the Western Pyrenees, both French and Spanish. All right, he just told you straight up that all these people are dark, even though they're different people. He said dark Welshmen and the dark Basque. We need not, however, go so far as the Pyrenees to find people identical with the small dark Welsh. The small dark Irish, again, the small dark Irish, because we're gonna get into the Irish, the small dark Irish of the Southwest of Ireland, the small dark Highlander of Scotland, all right, the Highlander, who was the high? The Stuarts were in the Highlanders. And the dark inhabitants of Devon and Cornwall are physically of the same race. The recent researches of Bedo prove also that the small dark Yorkshire Mayan, Yorkshire Mayan and Derbyshiremen are of the same small dark stock. All right, all these dark, swarthy, dark, so-called black Europeans. These are not African. Nobody's talking about Africans, though. You got to prove that. Iberians all didn't just come from Africa. The Iberians originated way over there in the uh, South uh, Anatolia, Asia Minor, Caucasus area. Yeah. So we got dark Irish, right? We got that in my last video, right? In South Carolina, some of those slave owner families were actually Irish. Dark, melanated mulatto as they were being called in the census mulatto but they were from ireland and they were slave owners right so small dark irish continuing says on the continent we find the same race still in Brittany, and in various districts in the valley of the lorry as it is clearly proved by dr broca's maps until at last we come to the basque of the pyrenees and the small dark population of spain spain all right population of spain 
Spaniards, Spanish conquistadors, Spain, there is no longer any room for doubt that the small dark Welshman is a fragment of a people formerly widely extended over Europe, but now broken up into ethnological islands by subsequent invasions, all right? What, the, what, 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 what was it like formerly, as he's letting you know again? That it was, these dark Welshmen were all over Europe. They were all over Europe, this dark population all over Europe, and then they got basically put into small areas because of invasions. All right, so we're talking about, you know, Jacobites, we're talking about Black Welsh, we're talking about Swarthy Europeans, right? We can't forget all this. We can't just hear it and then when we're reading something else, forget what we're reading, right? So again, so if we know Europeans were so-called Black, right? Yeah, dark skin, just like an African, just Swarthy like an African, right? Yes, with the wavy, curly, nappy hair, as you call it. Yes, Europeans look like that. So in this video, again, part two of my video of Swarthy Europe and its Aboriginal inhabitants. And no, this is a five hour video, almost six hours, five hours and 44 minutes. Don't expect everybody to go and sit through it or whatever, or even watch it completely. But that's why I'm doing this and we're going to get this like it's the first time again. We're two minutes and 50 minutes in. We're talking about the Jacobites a book, a great book we found here. And it's going to describe the Jacobites, how they look like. All right. So let's just get it. We're going to play the uh, video and the sound and everything. All right. All right. It's called the Jacobite Gleanings from State Manuscripts, Short Sketches of Jacobite, the Transportations in 1745 by Jake Macbeth Forbes. All right. I actually have the passenger list, the ship list from 1745 of the Jacobites. All right, and there's something very interesting in here. All right, this is from the Harvard College Library from the bequest of Thomas Rand Ward. All right, and again, when we're talking about these people right here, we ain't talking about Africans. This is not in a way to batch people or say, oh, you don't like Africans or, you know, this is self-hate or anything like that. It has nothing to do with that. We're trying to explain some historical uh, accuracy here. Right, because you were taught a whole wrong story and you were going with it and you bought it and you still buy it and you're still going with it. And even if you don't go with it halfway, you're still thinking we're talking about Africans. We haven't been talking about Africans, not all of them. When they were saying Iberian stock, that doesn't always mean African. Like we were saying, a lot of those Iberians, where are they really coming from? Even in their own history, they say they're not from where they are. They came from somewhere else. They weren't originally from North Africa. All right, so that's real history. You don't want to do the research and you want to say I'm making things up, that's on you, but we're going with real history here. All right, and we got to correlate everything. All right, Harvard Library, you know, has something right here again that we should have been known all our lives. Uh, it says from the bequest of Thomas Rand Ward, treasurer of Harvard College, 1830 to 1842. All right, it says the Jacobite Gleanings from State Manuscripts, Short Sketches of Jacobite, The Transportations in 1745 by J. Macbeth Forbes. All right, are y'all ready for this? So let's just get a little description here of what this book is about. It says the high road of Jacobite research has been well trodden down by hunters of historical records, but there still remain for the quest of the humble student of these remote times, the shady nooks and crannies, the budding hedger rows and the tempting pie paths nestling well out of the beaten track or what keats call ways made for searching among search um i'm sorry among such out of the way records the facts must undoubtedly be classed the petitions for mercy presented by prisoners under sentence of death as well as the accompanying affidavits testified by well wishers whether jacobite friends or royalist foes his Jacobites, if you don't know the story, were the supporters of the Stuart line of kingship in Scotland and England. Uh, of King James is a part of that line. And when he got dethroned by William the Orange, all right, uh, you know, there he still had supporters who were trying to help him get back on power. And they were never able to get him back. All right, they were defeated, rounded up, you know, 
and sent over to the, a lot of them sent over as prisoners and convicts to the American colonies, all right, as indentured servants. And a lot of them had sentences for life. A lot of these prisoners, they came here as indentured servants for life. That was Chattel property. That was life. And a lot of them were so-called black. We ain't talking about Africans being enslaved for life. We're talking about black Jacobites. These people do not have any ancestry coming out of Africa. You got to do the real research behind their ancestry. We went over it a lot already in the last two days. A lot of, you know, keep ignoring all that. All right. It's all right. But again, it's all personal. It's not factual. Okay? People, it's okay to be emotional about things she's got to be grown up about it you know and empty your cup you got to empty your cup you know like you said you know we know you know that not everything was taught to us correctly well it doesn't end where you think it ends it keeps going there's many layers to the lie you got to keep going with it let go let go because i'm about to show you something right here we ain't gonna read all this all right you guys can find this on archive.org just like i found it all right they're probably gonna take it down after this you know how they do axe drop axe con drop how they do that so a little bit more here we go an exact list and description of 150 rebel prisoners shipped at liverpool on board the veteran john ricky master for the leeward islands which were taken near antigua the 28th june last by the diamond privateer paul Marcelli, commander and carried into Martinico the 30th June of 1747. All right. What are we going to see here? The passenger list of all these prisoners, Jacobites. Now let's see. It says name, age, profession, the county, the statute, remarks. So any other thing, right? Mm -hmm. and number one, just for example, we're going to start with number one. It says Robert Adam, 18. He was 18. He was a laborer. County. He's from Sterling. He was five feet one inch very short he's brown he's brown uh -huh. smooth face right he's brown brown all right he's brown william yep. bell 46 weaver berwick 54 he's black black with curled hair got curly he's hair strong made all right douglas Dougal or dougal we already know about dougal dougal campbell servant lockaber 54 he's also brown complexion, brown complexion well made and ruddy brown mm -hmm. complexion yeah, alex mm -hmm. katana 17 all right young these are young miller bandanock all right he's from bandanock he's five five he's black ruddy black ruddy all right a lot of you is probably still saying well that probably means white well we'll nope. see all right we'll see black dougal ruddy. campbell dougal douglas du dougal dougal <laughs> swarty swarty right yep he's a servant Argyle, he's five five one four. He's brown also. Yeah, he's brown. And also ruddy, healthy. Ditto, ditto, ditto. Well made and ruddy, it says <laughs> it, I guess. Alex Campbell. All right, we already know about the Campbells. We just read that, right? Eighteen. He's a laborer. Iverness five four eight. He's pock pitted. He's pock pitted. Whatever that means. John Campbell. Ditto he's brown, twenty. Though. He's five two. He's swarthy. So these guys are all. Dero, dero. They're all brown complexion. One's pock pitted, the other one's swarthy. He's well made, <laughs> but they're all brown. All right, and they got look red hair. This guy got red hair. Alex David Davidson. He's ruddy and slim made. Andrew Edwards. He's black, well made, strong. All right, Alex Goodbrand. All right, so I want you to see all these people. Right, all these people. Look at the names. Brown, black, brown, black, brown, yep. black, thin, black, yep. black, brown, ditto, 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 and so <laughs> on, and so on, and so on. Do you oh. see any of your last names here? Do you see any These are Jacobites. You understand what a Jacobite is? All right, huh? Jacobites. This is a long list. I'm trying to tell you. All right, I'm going to show you sign. Donald McGillis, McDonald, McDougal, all right, muck, muck, muck. We already know what all that means. McDonald, McKee, McKee, Daniel McKee, McKee's a, uh -huh. oh, a Daniel McKee. Hmm. Yep. McKee. Remember that for a future video, all right? Daniel McKee, the McKees, who's McKees? What does that have to do with a, a, a first person to own uh 
a, what you call it, property and apartments and like project style kind of buildings is the McKee. He was a McKee. All right. Now, look at this. It says, it says black, short neck, red hair, black, light hair, well made, fair. So he's fair, right? Brown, thick, black, swarthy, slender. Black, swarthy, slender. So that doesn't mean white because you can't be white, swarthy, right? Black, okay. swarthy. There you go. Brown, straight, sandy hair, brown. Ditto, 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 ditto. <laughs> black, straight, ditto, swarthy, lusty. Black, swarthy, <laughs> See all these uh, last names, right? These are the names. Black. Got John Pale Stewart. faced. There you go. Pale faced. We got a white man. All right. This is pale face. Or very light skinned Negro. So they tell you fair faced. Pale faced. When they're pale faced, they're telling you. All right. Fair. Black, brown, fair complexion. There you go. Pale. All right. So this, when they're saying black, it doesn't mean white or fair or pale because go. they're telling you when they're pale, pale complexion. Again. All right. So. Cootie Mills, and you know right there, man. Yo, Cootie Mill, man, good looking up for that, man. All right, man. <laughs> so, yeah, man, all right? You're trying to say, yo, Cootie Mill, black means uh, white, white, man. No, nah, man, right here, you see? They're using black for black, man. Because they even tell you when somebody's white or pale skin, they put pale complexion or fair. All right, as you see. All right? Confirmation. Distinguishing. Pales came from black, the word black, distinguishing people, all right? It doesn't mean that. This is a book from 1740s. Webster's Dictionary is from 1828. That came after. That definition you guys try to use to make it white, that came after 1828. And even after it came out in 1828, you still run with it, even though knowing that in 1828, um, it means uh, blank, uh, uh, no color at all. All right, but in 1740s, and we also read a 1730s book, right? The Black Jacobites, right? Don't forget, right? Being described as black. All right, I'm telling you right here in 1740s, just 10 years later, they're being distinguished, pale skin and black. All right, being distinguished. So it doesn't mean what you said it means. Again, all right, fair. Now, this could be a light-skinned, dark-skinned person. It could just be a light-skinned, but they're telling you straight up, pale complexion, fair. Could be straight up a white person, right? Straight up, pale, a real pale person. Brown, dark complexion, well-made. Joseph Brown, brown, dark complexion, well-made. Daniel Duff, right? What did we learn about Duff and Dub? All right, dark hair, healthy, brown, sickly, sickly. Wow, he don't sound good. Well made, brown complexion, brown complexion. All right, pale hair, sickly, dark visage, strong, healthy, pale complexion. All right, this guy's pale, James Mann. All right, and the list continues. There's a long list here. Remember how much they had dark complexion. Dark. So what is the uh, pattern we're seeing here? If anybody has noticed already, you know, I would ask my daughter, you know, what is the, what is the pattern? She would say, well, they're all dark. They're all brown. I'm like, yes, exactly. It's a majority of dark complexion. People here, brown complexion, swarthy, brown, right? Look at the names. James Lawson, John True, George Samuel, James Donald, Andy Matthew, Walter Minnis, James Lamb. So you think these people are African? Is that what you're saying? All right. We had a prominent person in our community yesterday at the end of my video saying, you know, she didn't promote African and 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 into North American, you know, and I that's I'm not promoting Africans either. I'm just reading history. I'm not saying these are African people just because they're dark skinned. That's not what I'm teaching, and you're not understanding. You know, so please try to pay attention. You know, I'm not going to say your name because I'm not trying to give you the views and the clout, you know, you're seeking. But, you know, as you can see, these are all swarthy, dark, you know, dark complexion, black, sturdy, look, dark hair, brown, black, dark brown, nut brown. He's a nut brown, dark hair, 
he's fair. Brown Spring, Brown. I'll look at the last names, Reed. All right? We're not talking about Africans here just because these are dark complexion people. All right? Brown, Sprightly, Light Brown, Light Brown. There you go. Even when they're light, Light Brown, they're getting very specific. All right? They were probably doing that for a reason. Make sure later on they'd be like, well, he's a, he's darker. Let's make him longer. Let's take, you know, he's pale. Let's, you know, you know, they were taking this for a reason. Black man, brown, light brown, dark chestnut. All right. Dark brown. This is Margaret Dykes, Mary McKenzie, Barbara Camel, James McIntosh. It says, this description was taken by Mr. Smith at Lincoln, York, and Lancaster in October 1746, all right? Primary source. Do you understand what a primary source is? These are people from that time writing this down, all right? This is not pseudo just because it's old. So a lot of people like to use that because we're reading older books that it means pseudo, that automatically older books are lie or pseudo. And that's totally false. And when you hear that, alarm should go off right there. You should see, why is this person doing this, trying to dodge me from this information? Why is this person trying to keep me from knowing this information? This is not pseudo. This is actually in Harvard Library. It's not under the fictional aisle. I don't even think they got a, well, they probably do got a fictional aisle. Like every other library, but I don't think this would be there in their fictional aisle. This is history. All right. And they don't teach people this. If they would have taught me this in school, elementary school, if they would have shown me this and said, dark, 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 <laughs> you know, swarthy brown, I'm like, well, teacher, th th well, that sounds like, like a black person, teacher. What was she going to say? You know, they don't even got the teachers trained to rebuttal stuff like this. Teachers can't even go outside of what they read those textbooks they're given they don't go outside of that but we're, we're going straight to the primary sources and we're not talking about africans all right on this video i did uh which is called genealogy is the key stop with the tags and crayon colors this is back from july of this year did a live my brother kiowa and some other uh, people that day and right here in this part of the video just want to show since we're correlating right now just want to remind everybody what I've shown before in case you haven't seen it, just to correlate. Again, this is a declaration of intention. This is something that people fill up when they, uh, I guess, migrate or get on a ship and come over to the Americas, I guess, uh, specifically to specific areas. They had to declare what, you know, what their intention was, basically, why they come in, like what king are you loyal to, what political party you belong to and all that. You know, and it also explains who the person is and describes the person's appearance. And we're going to see something very interesting here, right? Real quick, let me just remind everybody, we're going to go to this part about two hours into the video, two hours and 15 minutes, and here we go. There's thousands of this, hundreds. I'm not, <laughs> this was just seven examples somebody sent to me. Again, United States of America Declaration of Intention. And this is uh, John Leo Collins who his description is color, his complexion is dark. Dark complexion, height five feet, nine inches, 150 pounds. Color of hair is black, color of eyes is brown. And he's from Ireland. All right, so real quick, just to remind you. Now it says here, he is described as color white and his complexion is dark. Yeah, he's actually dark complexion. This is an Irish man. His color of his eyes is brown and black hair. So if you describe somebody saying, hey, complexion dark, hair black, eyes brown, are you going to think Irish? All right, so this is the point. I show actually seven of these examples on this video and much more things as well in this video. Very good video, very good discussion I had live with Kiowa that night and other people who were asking questions. We had a live chat, so go ahead and check that out. So again, 1886, we got an Irishman being declared uh, complexion dark, all right? Dark, even though he's being called white, what does that mean? See, is that status thing don't mean? Why would they have two different things? Why would they have color white, complexion dark? Does that make sense? 
And here we just have another example in the same video. This is the next, uh, this person is John Armstrong. He's age 40, description is color white, complexion dark. Another one, right? Again, I showed seven of these in this video. And he's from Scotland, born in Scotland, Scotland. All right, and uh, I wanna show you another example here of uh, how they're describing uh, some of these Europeans that are coming into America. This is another primary source here. And uh, so this is again from part two of my Swarty Europe and its Aboriginal inhabitants video. Very good video. Again, it's five hours long. This is about three hours and 11 minutes in. So I'm gonna just, you know, get it like it's first time right now, if you missed it, or we just gotta go over the information again, very, again, important to repeat things so you can get it down. All right, so you can understand the overall picture. Okay, so this is from the New York Historical Society Publication Fund. And this is the collections of the New York Historical Society for the year 1891. So we're not talking about pseudo stuff here, just because it's old. Officers of the Society, 1892, President John. Okay, so it's telling you the people, just look it up. So this is the muster rolls of New York provincial troops. These are soldiers. Again, another census. A lot of these are Europeans. I'm going to show you, all right? And it's going to also describe them. It says, this volume contains the muster rolls of the various regiments and smaller organizations of troops raised and put in the field by the province of New York, which served during the Seven Years' War in America, or as it was later called, the Old French War, the war which terminated forever the power of France in the New World. Hmm. All right. So they covered the whole period of that, that war from 1755 to 1763, except those for 1757. All right. So it's a muster role, like a census role, basically, of those soldiers from those times. All right. Fighting in that seven year war. New York muster row, 1755, 1764, Albany, June 4th, 1755, a list of Captain Edmund Matthews Company mustered the fourth day of June at the city of Albany in the year of our Lord, 1755, before Hanse Hansen Esquire, Major and Jacob, all right, Ten Ike and Garrett Marcells, Esquire. Their names by certific certificates produced to us and also the men in person. All right, so they got two sources for the names. The men themselves, the person told them their name and they had a certificate, they're saying. So they can verify that these names are real. So it says, where were they born, their trade, their complexion, and when listed, right? So we got somebody from Germany, right? He's a gunsmith and he's brown. Brun. Right, Bruin, he's Bruin. Like the Bruins, like the Boston Bruins. You talking about that. the Indians, the Indians that used to play hockey up in New England. That's what they were talking about. We got England brown. Oh shit! They got Ooh, county stupid. black. Yeah, what you see? <laughs> Indian. Where did you see? Oh yeah, there you go. Indian, straight up. They're like, well, we're not gonna say black. We're not gonna say, well, he's Indian. And another one. And another one. All right. All right. So from Westchester brown from Albany dark so we don't know you know England brown QS County I don't really know what that is uh, we got an Ireland sailor he's brown I got another Indian right here Indian brown Mariner he's an Irish Mariner brown right QS County brown Jersey fair right here Germany brown he's a busher all right, so again, just wanted to show the correlation, right? We just saw the Jacobites. They also, these people over here, there's Europeans here being called brown. Germany, brown. Switzerland, Turner. He's brown. He's a Turner. We got a German farmer. He's brown. Oh, we got a Jamaica guy. He's dark, and he's fighting in the army here. Seven-year war. Yeah, Oyster Bay, dark. Look, dark. North Castle, dark. Hempstead, dark. Oyster oh. Bay, Hempstead Dark, Jamaica, Jamaica Dark, Jamaica Fair, a fair Jamaican. <laughs> right. That's uh, Sean Paul, Sean Paul, right? Yeah, Sean Paul. Fair Jamaican. 
North Castle Dark, Greenwich Ruddy, Ireland Dark. There we go. Boom. An Irish Dark. It's a long list. You can go through the whole thing. I found a bunch of them earlier. That's why I wasn't sure everybody. So I just want to show that it's in here. A, yeah. a dark skin, a dark skin Irish. All right, correlating with the Jacobite dark skin and all that. And we got a Jamaica dark and an Ireland dark. What's the difference when they start talking? They probably each with each other. Like, yeah, man. Yes, the old mother country. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, which one? I'm like, oh, the, the one over there the, across the sea. <laughs> <laughs> This is not trying to, we're just trying to make, you know, we're just trying to have fun with it, but no, nah, man, we just got to acknowledge. If you have this in your ancestry, you got to acknowledge. And a lot of brothers know they got this in the mm-hmm. ancestry in Jamaica and they acknowledge it. They know that, um, you know, they, 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 they acknowledge all their life that they're local Aboriginal, Arawak or whatever, and Irish. They don't know nothing about African. Yeah. And they were, what you say, what they're saying here, dark, you know. Hempstead, Taylor, dark. Yeah. Hempstead. Sound like the place they were growing some crop like Oh, they were growing a lot of hemp right there. You know that. Hempstead, man. Yeah. Prussia. From Prussia, he's dark. Look at that. Prussia's yeah. in uh, Germany, I believe. Yeah. All right. That's a dark German. We just saw the video earlier, right, of the dark moors. They're like, oh, I'll take it down. It's racist. <laughs> You know, but hey, here's one of them right here fighting f- for you over here in America, seven year war. But uh, he was eventually probably classified as a Negro. Yeah, they're all dark until you get to Oyster Bay Cooper. He's fair. Yeah. Goes back to dark again until you get to the shoemaker from Germany. So we got a Negro, right? So what's, <laughs> why, is the, why is the rest of them not Negroes? Yeah. Oh, this is 1746, right? Yeah, so Jamaica, right, Negro? So is he the only Chateau right now? Like, is that is the rest of them indentured? Yeah. Maybe. So real quick, you see how they have uh, the other Jamaica as dark skin, and they got this Jamaica as Negro. Yeah. We got another German darkie right here. It says dark Germany. And then an Indian again, Ruddy from England, dark German. This is a, not a site. This is a book. It's the Muster Rolls of New York Provincial Troops from 1755 to 1764 by the New York Historical Society. All right. So another thing that I went over uh, in this video, part two of my Swarthy Europe and Aboriginal Inhabitants video, it's also some references of descendants of Europeans in America and how they were being described, just like the uh, passenger list we saw in the Muster Roll um, of those Europeans or those soldiers. Um, some important people, figures in the U.S. This is one example in this video um, of how he's described. Let me just uh, go ahead and play that real quick. This is the uh, American orator's own book of the art extemporaneous public speaking, including a course of discipline for obtaining the faculties of discrimination, arrangement and oral discussion with the debate, and exercise and argument of declamation and numerous lectures for practice, blah, 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 blah. James K. John and Brother, 1836. Chief Justice uh marshall i believe it's john marshall we'll get to his name the chief justice person of marshall because they're describing all these important people right now it says here the chief justice of the united states is in his person tall meager emaciated his muscles relaxed and his joints so loosely connected as not only to disqualify him apparently for any vigorous exertions of body but to destroy everything like elegance and harmony in his air and movements Indeed, in his whole appearance and demeanor, dress, attitude, and gestures, sitting, standing, and walking, he is as far removed from the idolized graces of Lord Chesterfield as any other gentleman on earth. To continue the portrait, his head and face are small in proportion to his height. His complexion is swarthy. All right, John Marshall, Chief Justice of the United States. We're gonna, I'm going to show you who he is, what Wikipedia shows us, right? But this is a primary source. Again, this is a primary source describing him. His complexion is swarthy. Swarthy means black. There's no going around that. That's black. Dark skin. The muscles of his face being relaxed. All right. So it continues with him. Who is John Marshall? We got another body snatcher here, guys. 
<laughs> Attack of the Body Snatchers. That's how I call it now. John Marshall. It says here was an American politician and lawyer and served as the Chief Justice of the United States from 1801 to 1835. Marshall remains the longest serving Chief Justice, fourth longest serving Justice. All right. So he was under Adams. All right. He was the Marshall served as the United States Secretary of State under John Adams. All right. Under John Adams. Let's go to the picture. All right. Now I'm asking you, does this guy look like a swarthy guy to you? <laughs> all right, uh, yo, Cody, man, honestly, man, nah, he don't look swarthy at all. If swarthy means dark brown or dark complexioned or so-called black. All right, so you guys get it? Who are these people they're painting and giving us? All right, so we did a couple examples of that. And this would be another example uh, right here. Ultimate Collection, Military Journals, Rules of Civility by George Washington, Washington Irving, blah, blah, blah. By himself, George Washington himself, right? This bold dragoon, they're talking about Lieutenant Colonel Banastri Tarleton. This bold dragoon with parentheses, there you go. So noted in Southern warfare was about 26 years of age of a swarthy complexion. All right. From primary sources, swarthy complexion with small black piercing eyes. Remember, he was from Liverpool. He's from England with a swarthy complexion. All right, so you guys ready to see born a, born a, what is it, tar, Tarleton? All right, man, don't be disappointed. Don't be disappointed. All right, Wikipedia did it to us again. But not Sir Tarleton. We got another body snatcher here, guys. The body snatchers. So, all right, this is what I'm saying to everybody. And you know that famous line George Bush messed up. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me, right? Shame on me. You can't fool me twice. I should have known better. I should know better, man. After that Jacobite video I did, showing all those black complexion described Jacobites, and then they were showing all these white, you know, pale face paintings, right? I should have known better. You can't fool me twice again, because I know Tarleton from primary sources, uh, George Washington himself is saying he's swarthy complexion. He's a swarthy complexion guy. He doesn't look like this guy. This guy's not a swarthy complexion guy. There you go, swarthy. That's not swarthy to me. All right, break the spell. And just an example here, just describing this guy, Louis Wetzel. All right, it says he was about five feet, nine inches. In height, very broad-shouldered and full-breasted. His complexion was dark and swarthy as an Indian's and his face pitted with the smallpox, all right? So this European, Louis Wetzel, all right, was dark and swarthy, just like an Indian. Dark and swarthy, just like an Indian. You can't be both black and white, right? What does swarthy mean is dark complexion. And like an Indian, correlating the complexion of the Indians, copper colored tribes of America. And before we get off uh, this video, part two of Swarthy Europe and its Aboriginal inhabitants, I just want to show a sign that's towards the end of the video. Famous person here, just so you can get uh, comprehension. All right, scrapbook. It says here the scrapbook, volume six, July, December 1908. And it's talking about John Randolph. Who's John Randolph? Well, John Randolph is the celebrated Randolph of Roanoke. He was the most famous descendant from the marriage of John Rolfe and Pocahontas. He's the son of Pocahontas. Now, look at this guy right here, right? <laughs> this is what they're saying, John. Remember, Pocahontas, right? Remember earlier what they were saying? As dark and swarthy as an Indian, right? So, okay, where's his... At least, at least something. Where's this mixture, if anything, if any, right? Like it says, it is well known that some of the oldest and most notable families in Virginia are descended from the marriage of John Rolfe with the Indian princess Pocahontas. Descent from Pocahontas indeed is regarded as an honor. The most famous of her line was the celebrated John Randolph of Roanoke, who had indeed characteristics that were more Indian than Caucasian. He was more Indian than Caucasian. Look at him right here. <laughs> really. <laughs> So who's this guy you're showing here? If he's more Indian than Caucasian? Body snatchers. Body snatcher. <laughs> well, 
what does it say here? It says, he was swarthy of complexion and fierce and untamable in all his ways, fond of dueling, noted for his bitter tongue, and feared amongst as much by his friends as his enemies. He lived almost as a hermit at home, yet took an active part in politics. When he was in the United States Senator, he used to stride into Senate into the custom of a hunter. You hear what is going on? This guy was dread. Not this guy. Not this fake guy, but John <laughs> Randolph, the real John Randolph, the swarthy complexion son of Pocahontas he was a senator did you know that and he was a swarthy guy he was a black man right because John Rolfe was probably a black man too we got to dig into that yeah. I haven't done the research swarthy. he might be swarthy European too yeah so if All right. it's a true story then uh, you know one of them had to be swarthy right in order to pass that swarthy on. Okay. Both of them were swarthy to make the swarthy pass on. Yep. Again, he was swarthy. When he went into the Senate, what did he do? He put on a custom. says, no, nah, he didn't put on a custom. He put on his traditional clothes from his mom of a hunter. He went in there like an Indian hunter and with two huge dogs of his heels. So he real had... quick, want to talk about this guy I found here on the internet. I was doing some research and ran into him and correlated with what I researched and shown you guys before. Says here a South Carolinian among the Mormons. I remember who the South Carolinians were, right? You've watched my Huguenot video and also my Sephardic Morisco Free People of Color video from South Carolina. Well, this guy fits the the role here. Uh, says in 1853, Solomon Nunes or Nunez Carvalho set out on the fifth and final expedition of explorer John Charles Fremont through the Rocky Mountains in search of a westward railroad route to California along the 38th parallel. Carvalho, an observant Sephardic Jew born in Charleston, South Carolina, had never imagined himself an explorer. Again, what? Carvalho's a Sephardic Jew from Charleston, South Carolina. Oh, really? Huh, is that a pattern? Yes, you see how this is history? Who was really going into uh, South Carolina? It was Sephardic Jews and Moors. Remember, so-called Haganuts. All right, so uh, uh, what more can we learn about this guy all right again carvalho in los angeles this is him right here you see that all right what does he look like mm, let me see so solomon nunez carvalho pointed of two of los angeles most important attributes in the aftermath of his three months sojourn there in the summer of 1854 all right so he was actually very uh he was actually going on this trip with the mormons uh, he made it all the way from south carolina all the way through utah and all that and ended up in california los angeles all right this guy took a lot of pictures and painted a lot of things that's used in his history to his pictures are not very good and have not survived for some reason but i've seen other qualities of them and i can see negro people in it and so to me it's like they're hiding something but either way just one of the things i wanted to point out uh, about cavallo in los angeles is that he was actually one of the founders of los angeles jewish community all right he was actually one of the founders there right so south carolina sephardic jew right so here he is in uh, Wikipedia, Solomon Nunez Carvalho, again, was an American painter, photographer, author, and inventor. He may be best known as an explorer who traveled through the territory of Kansas, Colorado, and Utah with John C. Fremont on his ex fifth expedition. Many of the famous images of Old West are based on images he made. All right, so real quick, he was born in 1815, where in Charleston, South Carolina. What's very significant about Charleston, again, what did we learn in my video? is that Charleston was a free people of color city mostly. It was basically people of color there majority. And these people were not all just Indians or African slaves. The majority were black Europeans, Sephardic Jews and Moors. Again, he was born in this city of, 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 of people of color, Charleston, South Carolina. So Sarah Cohen de Acevedo and her husband, David Nunez Carvalho, who were both born in England, all right? So not instead of anybody being a slave or half slave or, or Negro or anything like that, right? To Jewish families of Portuguese descent. What did we learn about the Portuguese? That they were swarthy, the Iberian. We already know that. We know a lot of the Portuguese. Look how they ended up in England. Why did they end up in England? Because again, these Portuguese were Moors and Sephardic Jews who were expelled by the Catholics, right? They had to end it up. You know, all these years traveling through Europe ended up, well, their particular family in England before they ended up in America, right? So we know the Portuguese, this is a portrait of him again. You know, this is how they're showing him. I actually colorized the portrait and I wanted you guys to see it real quick. 
and this is the portrait i colorized again i did this on my heritage this is how i colorized my picture they got great software there you guys can go try it out now this guy looks to me like a mulatto that he has some kind of so-called negro blood in him a lot of people if i were just to show this to you right away before even telling you he was jew or south carolina or even european you would have not even thought he might have not been mixed or or mulatto or something you can see it in his beard you can see his hair is like looks like his gel has been straightened and stuff you know might be more coarse all right but what i wanted to show you is that that mulatto looking that we just read in the book no uh nation knows no color line they're talking about the prussian the polish jews who were mulatto looking and then when the dude got to america he said well all the uh, american mulattoes may remind him of the jews sephardic jews right so in his history may he might be light-skinned a little bit here or what you say half or half and he might not be full so-called negro as you call him but he looks like a lot of so-called african-americans today that are what would be considered mulatto or whatever um but the reason I'm just showing you this is you can see, get a better perspective of not how all Europeans didn't look a certain way. Now, I want to show you what they try to make this guy look into sometimes. And this is what they do all the time. So now look at this website, Camino Occidental. This is Solomon Nunez Carvalho, same guy. Look at this white guy right here. Does this look like the same guy right here? Even though they try to make him look a little bit. Now they're trying to make him look a little bit more white. Now look at this site right here, Google Arts and Culture, Solomon Nunez Carvalho. Now look at this guy. He don't look nothing like this guy. You see how they're trying to switch him up, make him look more white? Solomon Nunez Carl was an American painter, photographer, author, and inventor. All right, same guy. Same guy. They're trying to make a difference. So I just wanted to show you this. All right, Sephardic Jews. All right, do you have anything like this in your ancestry? How do you know? Only way to know is doing your genealogy. All right, so don't rule out all these Europeans. Because you never know, you know. You know, you look at old pictures like this, you see, uh, this is, I guess, in Philadelphia, it says here, Mother Bethel, Philadelphia, place of meeting of the Centennial General Conference 1916. Over here says, first church built on spot where blacksmith shop stood, incorporated in 1796. So I believe this is in Philadelphia, but you can see their people, they're all people of color, very distinguished people of the state of Pennsylvania, people of color. All right, you see this? Let me just show you another uh, picture. We're going to study all these people in future videos. All right, I'm going to show you an example today what I'm talking about, but especially with this guy in the middle, who he is. We're going to try to see who his ancestry is. All right, are all these people mixed with so-called slaves, supposedly? Or are, all, are, are some of these actual black European descendants? And if they are black European descendants, and if do they have descendants that today are called African-Americans, all right, and they're thinking they're either Indian or African slave. They might actually be like European descendants. That's what I'm showing you. There's nothing wrong with that. Let me show you another picture here. Again, this is from, it says here, Library of Congress, radical members of the first legislature after the war, South Carolina. All right, so this is a picture again of distinguished members of South Carolina. This is from, I believe, 1868. 1868 all right let's go to the info it says radical members of the first legislature after the war south carolina it says summary photo montage of members of the first south carolina legislature the first south carolina legislature following the civil war mounted on card with each member identified all right this was published in 1876 but i believe this was about 1868 this actual that it was the first all right, now again, let's go back to it. Very important, right? Real quick, so you can see. First, right? Look at, I know you're gonna see white people in here and pale skin people, you're gonna see people of color as well, all right? You see here, right here, right here, right here. Some of them look white, but they're not even white, all right? And you see more people of color here. You see these two white people, but you see all the people of color down here, all right? Are you saying all these are descendants of slaves or African or Indians? No, a lot of these are Sephardic Jews and Moriscos. This is South Carolina. You got to accept reality, what I'm showing you. All right. A lot of these are Europeans that look so-called Negro. They're Europeans.